Welcome to the guest book at UCSD, The Positive Place for Thinking People's TV. I'm Professor Benetta Jules Rosette in the Department of Sociology at UCSD and Director of the African and African American Studies Research Project. And here with me today is Mighty Mo Rogers, internationally acclaimed blues artist, keyboardist, and composer. He will be at UCSD for the Blues and Border Music Festival, and we are really pleased to have Mo with us. Welcome, Mo, to UCSD. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, Mo, I'd like to talk to you a little bit, just informally, about how you got started as a blues musician. And I think the audience would be really curious to see how someone now who has won, by the way, the award for a blues record of the year in France, his new album, Blues Is My Wailing Wall, is just really selling. He's also been nominated for the W.C. Handy Award, one of the major awards in the blues industry. And Mo, um, people would like to know, how did you get started? What got you interested in music and in blues? Well, specifically, I'm from the Midwest, from Indiana, and there were blues clubs outside of where I was born, East Chicago, Indiana, and Gary. And one of my best friends, um, Woody B. Spencer, passed away. We used to sneak out as kids. I was 15 years old, and I would go to these juke joints. And they were really interesting because there was sawdust on the floor, and there was gambling in the back room. And we just were kids, but we were about 16, and I guess I didn't think about our age. We'd go in, and I would listen to all these great artists were there. I was privileged to see people like um, T-Bone Walker would come through, um, Willie Dixon, the great songwriter, Eddie Boyd, and Jimmy Reed. So these people, seeing these figures, made me want to go into music. I had studied classical piano when I was younger, 12 and 13 and 14, and that was ground me in the musicality of uh, Western European music. But when I heard blues, it like a fire opened up. I said, I wanted to be a part of this, this blues voice, this vernacular text. And later you played with some of these greats like T-Bone Walker, yeah. Albert Collins, mm -hmm. and uh, you, what was that experience like? It was a dream come true. I saw them when I was 15 and I was in California playing at 25. Wow. And um, T-Bone Walker was an amazing, of course he wrote Stormy Monday, which is a classic blues song. And he relates stories when he went to France, how in Europe he would do a lot of the stuff playing the guitar behind his back. But he wanted to see this great guitar work and he would play with holding one hand and drinking like this on the guitar. They didn't want to see it. they wanted to see the great blues and he, speaking to him, reminded me of this, he's from Texas blues and backing with Albert Collins, he's from Texas also, we seeing him make his guitar talk and do all these kind of things like this. So it was kind of a school for me. It would call it a chilling circuit, but for me it was a royal banquet. And it <laughs> taught me the power of this, this great music. Can you tell us musically, uh, and maybe play for us a, mm -hmm. a, an example of how the blues came across the Atlantic, crossing the ocean uh, in a way into the Americas, and then what happened to the music of the slaves and of the Africans after they arrived here on the shores of North America? How did it change and how did it develop into the blues? Well, basically, as you said, crossing the Middle Passage, these um, griots brought the music or brought the voice. Blues is a, what I call an oral vernacular text, or I call it OVT. And basically, it's a continuation of that. We are an oral people. Um, in the South, as you said, European music is based on a pentatonic, uh, diatonic scale. And in many Africans in Western Africa, a pentatonic scale. That was a conversion of this. It's almost like a thesis, antithesis, and the synthesis is blues. Blues is uniquely American. 
it's almost like as if at the crossroads, the African ran into himself, the African American, and blues was born. Can you give us an example and maybe play for us, mm -hmm. like the pentatonic scale, so that people could hear and understand what the blues combines? This, um, what I'm playing, it's um, the song, the sound you will hear is uh, kalimba. It's been sampled, and I unfortunately bring a small kalimba with me, which I can play off African thumb piano. But the sounds you hear will be kalimba sound, and I'm playing on a pentatonic scale, which sounds like this. Took away the drum That's how the blues did come Took away the drum That's how the blues did come a pentatonic scale and I'm saying in the song texturally that blues came about when the African was de-Africanized. You know in Africa and I know you know quite well um, the doctor said that and it's in the Shawnee tribes in Ghana there are drums that are so sacred that you don't even touch. That's right. They're built for display. The master drums. Right. That's right. And because of that out of this space is the sounding of the drum of silence. If a Thoreau could say the uh, voice of a different drummer, then the ultimate drum is within our heart. And I think because they took the drum away from the African, particularly in the South, out of this space, this void came to what I call this holy howl, which is, which is blues. Did you want to illustrate something of the drum, the way that the drum works in Africa, and right. what happens with the drum again in the blues, and its absence? It's almost the silence of yes. the drum. Absolutely. But you can show us how that kind of works. Well, this is a talking drum, and basically, um, I won't put it up here because I have a mic up here, but you can. <laughs> Textually, for an African, it is critical. It is my thesis that basically because the drum was taken away from the African, totally so in the South, not in South America, Central America, as you know, mm -hmm. in South America and Central America there's tremendous amounts of African music, polyrhythms, right. all the way up through the Caribbean. But when you come to the Delta area, this is this void, this, and this holy how comes out as to me it's an ontology from the being of the people, necessary song of remembrance, basically. Well, with the um, Christianization of the slaves, the drum, of course, was viewed as an evil instrument, Absolutely. and their drums were burned and taken away. Yes. And the drum in Africa went along with the tonal languages. Most African languages have two to three tones, and the tones that you hear on the drum are the tones of language. That's how you could have across from Central Africa, across West Africa, what's called talking drums. Right. People would then beat in the tonalities, and anyone listening to the drum could hear, Mo is coming to UCSD, mm -hmm. and he could beat that message out, right. and it would go from village to village. And of course now in Africa that's been replaced by uh, C, uh, CVs and, yes. and radio right. uh, um, and cell phones. Yeah. Cell phones have replaced the talking drum, so we've taken the drum away a second I, time. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the drum is still there as a central feature of all African music. And of course in blues, with the drum removed, Mo, you were saying something to me about how the old blues men like Robert Johnson and others mm -hmm. used their feet. They used to tap out the drum rhythms. That's right. It was a problem 
in terms of recording Robert Johnson and Sunhouse and these famous, for me, rural blues men, they were, John Lee Hooker recorded a hit record in the 40s called Boogie Chillin. Maybe, maybe you've heard it. Well, in this record, it's just him stomping his feet and John playing. John Lee. That's right. He's still he's just, with us. He's still with us. And I, I theorized that to me, they were conjuring up their, the ghosts of their past and it's stomping, you know, because they were, they had lost their drums, but yet the internal drum was coming out. It's almost like as if there was a dialogue with Africa, a dialectic that was happening. And it was very unconscious this happened because the power of the blues is greater than the sum of its parts. It's our ancestors, it's our people talking through us, the so-called, what I call the blues voice, you know. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we always negotiating with economics because we were economic commodity Blues negotiates with that, try to, with dignity and humility, and that's always a problem because of the commodification of blues. So it's constantly renegotiating economics because we were a total commodity, and we're constantly taking that away from ourselves, and we have to negotiate to, to legitimatize and to make authentic and with dignity. This is always a problem that we try to do, but this is what happens. This is the power of the blues, I believe. Great. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of those old blues men. You talked about them in terms of your history and how you met them as a young man and how they inspired you. But let's talk about what they actually did. And of course, one of the most important early ones, Mo, you might want to hold okay. this up. Sir. It was Robert Johnson, mm -hmm. born uh, at the, about the turn of the century, what, around 1910 or so? Yes. Um, I don't have the exact date, but Robert Johnson by the 1930s had become uh, an important figure. He's one of the first early blues men to be recorded, and he's often known as well as the father of rock and roll. Now, Daryl's going to demonstrate this man He's going to do a song by him on Robert Johnson. And um, I wanted him to do this because what you got to understand is that most of you know this, I would think all of you, that blues was not electric initially. It was a commutative thing, not written or created by people to be commodified. That all came later. And Robert Johnson is the ultimate mystery blues man because of how he lived, how he died. And he write, wrote these incredible tunes. And he only, what, how many, 39? Good to me. thesis and recently an article in our Elimu magazine on the origins of the blues. You tell people a little bit about the, the field haulers and the early southern blues. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well basically, you know, the part of the blues is the uh, 12 bars 
and then you've got your rhyme scheme, which is AAB, kind of amory pentameter kind of rhyme scheme. Yeah, can you give us a Robert Johnson example, for example, to show that AAB? I know there's one that you like. Yeah, let me do liked. this here. Um, I can't stumble. Ain't got no way to fall. I can't stumble. Ain't got no way to fall. So I stand here like a man standing straight and tall. Now I improvise on that, but what I wanted to show that there's a redundancy that takes place in the first two lines. But what's profound is that there's two lines with a difference. That's a there's a law in statistics which says redundancy is necessary for communication to take place. Now, I'm not saying these cats knew what they were doing on this level, but I think subconsciously there's incredible intelligence in blues because this art form has found no place else. And in its simplicity, it allows you to communicate and to say things. And yet in the text, which is the 12 bars, what is the first, and you have what is called the fourth, and the back to the first, and then you go turn around with the fifth, fourth and one. That became standardized through records. Before records, there was blues. And when you so could you show that for our viewers one more time? Mm -hmm. Those young people who are learning to play blues right. and rock and roll, here's, mm -hmm. here's the progression, the chord progression. Right, the chord progression is starting to one. Your tonic. Now I'm at the fourth. Back to the first. You know, the fourth. Back to the one. To the five, turn around. Fifth. Back to the fourth. Back to the one. And sometimes you turn on that. Nah, boom, boom, boom. Now jazz stretch out on this. And you take a song, you know, all the way back to people like W.C. Hanley, who really codified this and made it into, took it to bigger, major. St. Louis blues. That's right. And basically, he, it was out there when he discovered, he was formally trained, so he was able to write it down and transcribe it, because he did songs like Dixieland stuff, where it goes something like this. Let me turn this up here. Let me see. Oh. and things, different runs they have, even from ragtime, you hear the blues in it. You the blues the, is behind all of behind that. The blues it. is like a simple, raw yeah. bass. And then as you expand out into Scott Joplin's ragtime, W.C. Handy's w. blues, That's right. Jazz. swing. It what about continued. Fats Waller, someone like that? It, what kind of variation did he bring Of course, he was that? formally trained, so he did a lot of stuff, but I don't have a, his play or his music, per se, but basically, when he did all of this stuff, uh, earlier stuff. So you see it's just a then we stride. And all that stride stuff he did, you know, mm -hmm. you hear the blues in it, it it holds it all together. Yes. You know, it's the glue. The, the blues is a foundational exactly. music, exactly. which then moves us into uh, ragtime swing, That's right. rock and roll, and, and many Elvis other Presley. forms. Maybe you could uh, show people a little bit what does what urban blues sound like well, as opposed to uh, rural blues? Well, first of all, it's electric, basically. Um, Daryl Dunmore, who plays with me, um, he will be at the um, lecture um, Friday, plays some acoustical rural blues. Urban blues is very electric. Uh, Muddy Waters was one of the first purveyors of this when he came up the south. I think of the Mississippi River as a long electric cord. The further north they went, you know, it is, so it, got, it was plugged into Chicago. And basically urban blues dealt with the problems of Chicago and what it meant to be crossing borders. We had the border crossing type program and borders are constantly being crossed. One of the major borders crossed was in 1954. And in 54, some amazing things happened. I kind of thought this was kind of ironic. 
for what we're doing here. School desegregation came with the law of the land with the Brown and the Board of Education. And then Alvis Presley recorded and released the first songs he did, which were Afro-American blues. One was That's All Right. Some people always say That's All Right, Mama, but is That's All Right, and Mystery Train. Now, this is 1954. So Alvis was crossing borders, and desegregation was breaking down, and America was breaking and crossing borders. What's interesting is that the initial border crossing for both the school and music was profound in America because it's still shaping us today. Now, I'm going to speak just mainly about the music. What Alvis did was revolutionary, I believe, because in the I Love Ike of America in the 50s, and I'm a child of growing up in the 50s and in manhood in the 60s, these may have been happy days for the Fonz, but it was really tough across the tracks, if you know what I mean. These were country bunkins. These were people a lot of times scared. <laughs> Muddy Waters was fearful of the city, but he had to leave the plantation, and he snuck away, almost like a a slave in the night, you know, like, and he had, that's the only way he, he had to leave. But when he came to Chicago, he was very fearful because remember these rural blues musicians, as marginalized as they were, and their music was marginalized because many people in the black community looked down upon blues. You know, right. the, the middle class, this was like, they used to call it um, um, cornfield music. And, mm -hmm. it, and it was something that was not respectable. So when he came to Chicago, and it was electrified. He was one of the major purveyors of it around the world. The border crosses, you said, came to California. They went to New York. But the greatest, the quickest route from the Delta was, if you look on a map, is straight north. Right. That's where a lot of them went north. That's course, where the big effervescence exactly. took place. Exactly. But people, since we are here in Southern California, should know that between 1911 and 1914, there was a very important African-American migration, primarily into Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and this involved a great religious revival mm -hmm. called the Azusa Street Revival. That's right. That's right. And with those people came the music of gospel, right. but also behind, although they didn't right. want to acknowledge it, came yes. blues, blues music. Absolutely. All of those people who were singing gospel in Azusa Street, uh, although they didn't approve of blues, right. many of them right. uh, would sneak out and were also singing blues. So right. this became the basis for um, uh, an African-American folk music development mm -hmm. in the Los Angeles area. And this also influenced very much eventually San Diego. Mo, can you give us an example? What does that urban blues now sound like? Could you play um, a piece of that? Yeah. As opposed to the, we've heard the rural blues okay. and the pentatonic scale. So one of, maybe one of your favorite pieces that okay. illustrates Straits, uh, the more straight urban blues. Well, one of them is, and I, of course, this is, I don't have my guitar player here. And the guitar, I must say, too, became the signature instrument for the blues. Absolutely. And, because and later of what, rock and roll. And later rock and roll. It was critical. So I'm doing it on piano, but I'm going to show you basically. And it's a guy named Jimmy Reed who came from the South, lived in Guarini in a while, and worked in the mills and recorded for a label called VJ in Chicago. And he had, um, um, song called, uh, let me see, let me turn it up here. Honest I Do. Another great song he did, which is he's speaking that double language again. We spoke about Big the Boss secret Man, language, secret language, secret language of blues. Exactly, Big Boss Man, and uh, again, it's harmonic and guitar. So I'm, you have to hear it on piano. When I call, you 
example, and I'm doing a honky tonk mode on here to try to give you the kind of distance and time, but electric blues and the guitar, because of its portability, when it was electrified, became critical for, for urban blues. <laughs> That's what you hear a lot, which later became, as we said, rock and roll. Yeah, when I listen to that, it sounds almost like early rock and roll, or what was called R&B, rhythm and blues, Ex exactly. that became rock and roll. Right. Can you tell us now, what is Motown sound in relationship to blues? All of right. us have heard Motown sound. We know right. Diana Ross and Marvin right. Gaye and the Motown greats, and of course right. Stevie Wonder, who's gone <coughs> far beyond. But let's hear, what, what is well, Motown Well, Motown, one of the greatest writers, of course, Holland Dozier Holler. <laughs> Everybody's heard that. Set me free, why don't you pay? Get out of my land. Dun, 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 dun. Now that, what Motown had again, Holland Dozier Holler Holland wrote that song with great writers. Um, a guy named J Jameson, brilliant bass player, who came out of jazz, by the way, in Detroit. Detroit had a great jazz history. And the Funk Brothers and the Cats, who were the part and partial of the whole Motown rhythm section, were great musicians. Motown, to me, what they did with strong beats, strong lyrical content, and a love song for the voice of young America, as they called it. And what's right. interesting, at the height of Motown, 75% of the records were bought by white kids. At the height of hip hop now, 75% of the hip hop is bought by white kids. Yeah. So yeah. Motown was a marketing, Very there was marketing. a marketing of something that already existed right. and that was in black neighborhoods and right. we know we've seen the posters we grew up in, mm -hmm. or at least I did in one of these segregated neighborhoods where the music of record on the radio and in the theaters that we could go to for 50 cents on a Saturday afternoon like the Howard and the Regal, mm -hmm. that music was R&B. And really there good. we saw some people that later became quite famous. I continue Turner, mm -hmm. uh, from, from the South, Joe Tex, uh, South. Gene Chandler, the greats of early rhythm and blues, some mm -hmm. of whom moved into rock and roll, Marvin Gaye, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, and that was what you were calling the Chitlin circuit, but by right. the 60s it had evolved, it was, it was still alive as segregation ended, mm -hmm. and the people in there later would be, by the late 60s, drawn out into much larger venues, mm -hmm. rock festivals, and so on. But we had rhythm and blues, which Motown capitalized on, but exactly. which also continued to exist in its own right as a musical form, and often called soul music as well. Right, and what soul took, as you said, it took blues and the church gospel came together to do soul music. You had some, you know, all of the Otis Redding stuff, yeah. James mm -hmm. Carr, Dark Industry. This is all gospel stuff. Yeah. Straight from the church. see how of course we didn't mention a major one of these people who came straight from the church Aretha Franklin so many came from the church yeah. Sam many Cook, Sam Cooke uh, he's, he's her vibe. all of these to, to me the church was the, the home and the nest of producing this great sound that went into the world I, I saw someone said the difference between church music and and street or blues music and there's different children is that in church you do like this and in blues you do like this <laughs> you know um, but it's still part of what I call the blues voice so what is blues well blues is me and blues is you blues is American as in red white and blues we all have been colored by blues blues is the conscious and unconscious part of us blues is like a field, as in a corn field, as in a rice field, as in a cotton field. Blues is field theory, upon which is inscribed the facticity of a moving matrix. Blues even went to the moon. That's right. Blues went to the moon. Now, a cat named one of my heroes, Muddy Holland Wolf, had a song. He came out of the proud part. Say it loud, I'm black and proud, James Brown. So he wrote his called, Someday You're Gonna Look Up and See a Coon on the Moon. That's the name of the song. That's true. That was the name of the song, you know. 
and he was being proud of that there would be black astronauts. Well, it is my contention in the vernacular text, we went to the moon because when Armstrong landed on the moon, Buzz Aldrin was going around the moon and he told him his exact words says, you cats, be careful down there. <laughs> That's true, he said that. That's the vernacular text. It's what I call the OVT, oral vernacular text. So, Holly Wolf was right, we went to the moon. <laughs> you know, that's what's incredible about it, how it moves this way. I saw something amazing on TV not too long ago. President George, George is not president, I'm talking about his father. George W. Bush um, is running for president and he was debating um, John McCain. And what's interesting is that when, before they debated, they were going to shake hands to say they weren't going to throw any mud around each other. You know, you saw that, some of you did. I don't know anybody, you caught that or not, but when they shook hands, they shook hands like this. <laughs> Do you know how amazing that is? Huh? A soul shake that came out of Vietnam when the brothers were doing it. Clap fingers. There you go, snap, right? <laughs> All of that came from Vietnam, and I've got to know it, I forgot a lot of it, so you got to excuse me. Now, it's been broken down and simple, they shook hands with a soul clap, a soul shake rather, and you're supposed to do the snap. And the point is though, is that, again, that's the vernacular text, that's the dance part. You got the drum, you got the dance, and you got the song, and they did it. I don't even know they knew they did it, you know what I'm saying? But that's how blues infiltrate. In other words, it comes through the back door still. As Hollywood said, I'm a back door man. You know, blues is the ultimate back door man. So I say that to say that you see so many things in blues if you look around in a subtext, and I use it in my music. Now, ultimately, you can't explain blues, although even I try in being as loquacious as I am in this, words get in the way. Blues is a living condition of African Americans, and what is inscribed upon it is always a moving target. I want to go back to talk about you, Mo. Okay. We've talked about history now, and you made an album early in your career mm -hmm. with, produced with Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, and then most recently, of course, Blues is My Wailing Wall, mm -hmm. your new CD. Right. And, since we've gone through all this history, I think we're all up to Mo now. Okay. And what we call cerebral, you call cerebral or metaphysical blues right. is the term that you've been using. Yes. And blues is a source of freedom, emancipation, mm -hmm. and a metaphysical music. Now, certainly, you know, the slaves and the people out in the field with field howlers were not reading Heidegger no, as you are not. and talking right. about metaphysical right. music. So what do you mean by metaphysical blues and where are you going with your blues right. today? Well, for me, um, I'm trying to deconstruct the blues to get to blues. Um, okay. The blues is the obvious text that becomes very commodified. I believe that there's always this subtext, this secret blues that you can't even capture because the essence of blues is what it means to be the blues people, as Baraka calls us in his book, Blues People. I believe that we are that. To me, the metaphysics of blues is the power of the blues that came about through the door of no return, through the middle passage. Um, this is the door of no return. There are many doors of no return on Western Africa. Some now are been restored and they're tourist site and many famous people from President Clinton has gone through them right. and um, Colin Powell and they're seen looking out the door into the Atlantic Ocean where through this door of no return our ancestors came to America crossing the Middle Passage, which is the Atlantic Ocean, becoming Americans here, from Africans to African Americans. I think what we brought with us on that ship was the oral text. That's the power of the blues, people. The blues, as I said, takes from its text all of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it reconfigurates itself, and it transforms itself. And you stand taller because you stand on what you went through. It is a ultimately positive, it is ultimately life-affirming. Make no mistake, blues ultimately is life-affirming and optimistic. Because the only way out, blues says, is through. I wrote this song called Tuskegee Blues, which is about that. I saw President Clinton come on TV, 
and he said, we're sorry for what happened to these Tuskegee men over a 40 year span where, as some of you know, the syphilis experiments were conducted and black men were got it syphilis or infected with it to see the results of it as it goes over many years. So we're gonna do this song here, Tuskegee Blues, about a terrible time and what happened and how from that and through that, you say to yourself, as Americans and in democracy, which allows you to say that this won't happen again because we've put light on it. GFF. Now, Daryl's tuning and setting up his dobro to do this. Um, it's on the album, and it says, as he tunes up, let me just say that um, this is written as a tone poem. It's um, blues doesn't point fingers as more than point to life. As I said, it's a field theory which takes in everything. Everything is, can be used as food for it. Down in Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Alabama, the men were really sick. They had that disease called syphilis, but there was a cure for it. Now the doctors were supposed to help them, but they gave them no relief. You see, they had an illness too called that racial disease. Now I saw the president, you know he came on TV. Saying we're so sorry, causing so much misery. But for those men down in Tuskegee, sorry came way too late. Cause most of them had up and died, and a few alive can't wait. Hey doctor, hey doctor, you took a Hippocratic oath to heal and not to harm. But for some, it was a joke. Now here's what I'm a saying. Physician, heal thyself. Heal thyself. Heal thyself. Cause your disease is gonna kill you. And that will ruin your health. I say the disease is gonna kill you. And that will ruin your health. Tuskegee Blues. So this is not new. Uh, to me, the metaphysics of the blues is the fact that it takes this rhyme scheme again, which is AAB, which because of the symmetry of it, and because of the idea of redundancy, this communication takes place. Also, there's an ebonics. I say blues is our only legitimate ebonics in a way. <laughs> <laughs> that opens up a whole different I know debate it does. mode. Out. I know it does. We'll, we'll have another show yes. on ebonics. Which... Right. But you hear it when uh, legitimacy, I mean, when Elvis Presley said, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, using the double negatives in that, you know, right. or Aretha Franklin would say, ain't yeah. no way. You have you, your yeah. Elvis you, Presley. Right. You're hearing. I have, a, I have a song on the next CD called The Boy Who Stole the Blues. And, I'm, <laughs> and, I, and, and what I'm saying is that he was like a Prometheus. He took the fire from the black community when he went across the tracks. It's interesting to be called a mystery train because trains and traveling for musicians and for us as moving from borders and crossing the track, the bad side of town or the ghetto was always across the tracks. Yeah. And this song he recorded by Junior Parker, Mystery Train, is what he crossed that track and brought back um, blues to America. Um, Sam Phillips, the famous... So part of the king, the kingship of Elvis right. Presley that often gets forgotten when we, people make the tours to Graceland and mm -hmm. so forth is at least for African Americans and for all Americans, what he did was he took the blues, a yes. tradition. He took a tradition. And uh, he was able to... Popularize it. Popularize it, it and mm -hmm. also make it accessible. A and, uh, and acceptable too. And acceptable yes. to larger audiences. And this now, is radical in the 50s right. when it was racism, people, blacks were getting lynched and everything and this kid who was like uh, poor and he would consider being honestly called poor white trace. He was poor 
And he lived next to poor black people, and he loved black music and would sneak out and go to the black churches. And he brought this back, and he, he loved this, and it was kind of revolutionary for its time because white America, except for hip whites, wouldn't go on across the track hearing all this right. great music, you know. At the heart of blues, it's about freedom. And those pioneers of blues are true unsung heroes or vagabonds of this freedom. Um, and in, it's almost like a, what I call a primordial fire, creating for America a brand new paradigm. And that paradigm is Western music. Now, Alvis was kind of like um, Prometheus, if you will. You know, stealing fire from the hood and bringing it back to white America. Comfortable, shaking it up. Here's a cat who stole the blues. That's the name of a song I got on my next CD. But I do it in a positive spin. He stole the booze and he came across the mystery train, across the tracks. The good is always, in the old days, always across the tracks, for some of you all remember that. In a way it still is, but there ain't no train tracks, but it's still there, you know what I'm saying? He had a colored and style, and everybody said, wow. He shook up America. People trying to warn him.
is still in a vanguard because it reinvents itself. You buy the blues, but you can't buy blues. It's still there for you to explore, to take from, to do what you want with it. And although it has been and always will be commodified, you go around the world, you'll hear blues. You walk into a club in Singapore, Shanghai, Stockholm, you're going to hear some American-derived music. And that's the power of this incredible folkloric music from the South. So to me, the metaphysics of blues is that this power in the blues is almost like a, it was a paradigm in the West mm -hmm. that opened up and allowed for all these things to happen. Well, that's great. Um, Mo, from your new album, would you like to kind of, as we wind mm -hmm. down, maybe give us a selection that represents what you call the cerebral or metaphysical blues? And I'd like the audience to know that okay. while, while Mo is a master and you've seen him play in many of these styles from the old traditional blues all the way up to the urban blues, rock and roll, that Mo brings to blues his own very special reflections, uh, his notion of metaphysics, his idea of uh, really very salient, thoughtful lyrics that are contemporary. And yet, what you're doing is not rock and roll. What you're doing is not uh, in a certain sense jazz, it is still blues, it's but blues. it's a new, very new kind of blues. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so perhaps you could give what you think represents that. This is uh, what I call new blues, and I spell it N-U-B-L-E-U-Z. Right, new blues. <laughs> because it is contemporary, it's on the edge, but I'm expanding the envelope. Okay. You know, uh, this is called the Kennedy Song, All right. and it's from the album I knew it was on 18 minutes of the Nixon tapes I knew what was on 18 minutes of the Nixon tapes In the movie True Romance Dennis Hopper said the words And it blew him away I know the secret Mona Lisa smile I know the secret Mona Lisa smile You see it was a self-portrait Man has style But still everybody wanna know All they wanna know How Kennedy died Everybody want to know, all they want to know, how Kennedy died. He was a victim of the ultimate drive-by. Great, Mo. That's just beautiful. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to see a clip uh, in a little bit of okay. another one of your songs. It's not on the album, right. but it's going to be, I on guess, the, on a forthcoming on next, next, next album. Next album yeah. So our viewers will be privileged to mm -hmm. have a kind of inside track mm -hmm. into your next album. What's the name of your next album? Um, it's called Red, White, and Blues. <laughs> Red, White, and Blues. That's right. great. And uh, this is going to be called, this is called Picasso Blue, mm -hmm. and we're going to see it in the form of a clip. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if, Mo, you could kind of set that up for us okay. a little bit and say a little bit about Picasso Blue. Picasso Blue represents the kind of the, the new blues I do and what I'm trying to convey. In the text, it's multidimensional. It's saying different things. I took as a jumping off Picasso's Blue Period. You know, and saying that we all, in a way, in blues, we're in this blue period, you know. And I'm saying in the text, I actually textualized his, saw his paintings, really, from that period. And I used the names of the paintings. I guess I shouldn't give this away. You read the text, you are seeing the paintings. And I'm using this in the, in the texture of the song. And I'm trying to say, and I tie it together in love, because to me, the ultimate blues song is about love, you know, and life. And that's what this song's about. Um, I'm living in a world of just one hue. Everything is Picasso, Picasso blue. blue. I'm living in a world, just one world. Without you, everything is Picasso blue. So that's basically what it's about. And it's kind of what I call blues jazz format, how I'm playing it. And um, hopefully people understand it. I went to the Getty Museum 
Uh, um, some of you been there probably too. I've called it the Getty Mausoleum when I came out. <laughs> Mainly because the sky was blue, I was blue, the ocean was blue, and all I saw was Picasso's period, period, paintings in there from his blue period. Now you know I got some blues. I got Picasso blue. at a bar Blind man playing on his guitar Barcelona red is sounding blue Everything's the same but I don't have you When you push love aside People, you got the colors of the night the colors of the night are just one hue In that place and time Ain't got no reason and no right You will love and love Till love is through with you Thank you for spending this time with us here at UCSD Guestbook. Thank you. And also for being 
on campus uh, with our students, giving a Regents lecture, uh, working with them uh, in music, in sociology, in ethnic studies, in African studies, uh, to bring a new vision of the blues and of African American music to UCSD. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I'm honored to be here in your program. I think it's fantastic. I hope that this will be an ongoing dialogue that we'll have and that you will come back again. Most definitely. Thanks. And I want to thank our viewers for joining us today with Mo Rogers and taking a travel back, looking at the history of blues and of African American music, tracing it back to its African roots, and going forward through rock and roll, blues, rap, hip hop, with Mo's expert guidance. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. And good night. Blues is my world and war. Blues is my world and war. Blues is my world and war. I hear it call to me. I hear it call. I hear it call to me. I hear it call.